Here we go. So Paul Critchley, dear friend, worship leader from the UK, I have a couple of questions for you. <laughs> and uh, my, <laughs> my, my first question is, um, where do you see God at work in the UK and beyond? What's, what's been exciting you? I mean, we're coming out of the pandemic now. And, uh, you know, you ha have a, a lot of global connections and connections yeah. in the UK. What's what, what's your sense? Of, what's your take on things? I think we're, we're early in still here in the UK. There's um, I'm privileged to be part of a, a local church connection. We have something called a Connect uh, group that meets every month with local uh, local church leaders, organizational leaders. And um, the, the big thing I'm hearing there, but not just in the city level is, this sense of trying not to rush ahead out of pandemic, trying to really find out what's what's on God's agenda for for the months ahead. And whilst that's a, a, a great a great statement, it, it comes with all sorts of challenges for for church organisations as well, because uh, congregations uh, have dwindled, finances have uh, been sapped, and uh, some people obviously not come back to church. Certainly in the UK, we've got lots of folks who haven't come back to church still yet either because they feel vulnerable or actually they, they've fallen out of love with the church context um so i think we still got a way to go in terms of you know what church looks like in the uk and um as I, I think that's probably not uncommon in some of the other nations that i'm connected to i say connected to just like this on zoom rooms really uh because uh there's, there's certainly not much travel taking place yet but i think that I think the good thing about that is it's it's causing us, I, I, I mean us by the church, to to get close, to continue to listen to uh, or try to listen to what the Lord is saying about about the days ahead. And I think one of the one of the words that I've I've heard most when I've uh, connected, particularly into Eastern Europe from the UK, is that there's a sense of this there's there's a harvest that's to come, and uh, part of it's to do with. Uh, the dependency that people have have, um, have found that they've, they've missed so much, I guess, over pandemic and wondered what life has been about. So they start to ask questions about, you know, where does God fit into all, all of this? And uh, so things like evangelism on the streets here in the UK and certainly in Eastern Europe seem to be the most fruitful than they have been for many generations. So give you an example of this. I, uh, the last two weeks have been involved in uh, worship, uh, worship and prayer called a burn here in the UK. I don't know if you have those in America. Yeah, do you have burn? Yes, we yeah. do. So we've had the Commonwealth Games burn over this past uh, past number of days. So 336 hours of nonstop worship and prayer. So that's been taking place in Birmingham all around the Commonwealth Games. But around that, it's been this whole sense of church coming together as well with a heart to uh, reconnect people with the Lord. So there's been many uh, evangelists on the streets, healing on the streets in Birmingham. And the reports back are that, you know, conversations are much more open than they've ever been. Salvation is taking place on the streets. Healing is taking place on the streets. Cool. So it's good news, but it's uh, it's very different than it looked before. So in terms of future, it's very difficult to say because I think we're at the early stages of. But I think there's this, it stirred a hunger up in individuals in terms of their relationship with the Lord. So what's the pandemic um, meant to me? Uh, we were just sharing personally earlier on. It's, it's it's been quite damaging to lots of Christians. It's been quite a hard time. So, what does the future look like for me as an individual, individual Christian? And also, what does it look like for a church? And so, I think the benefit of that is um, certainly in our in our town, we've got churches on saying, actually, let's not go back to business as usual. Let's spend a bit of time listening and waiting on the Lord, and let's see what His agenda is going to be for for the next stage. So I'm not sure there's a clear cut answer, but I think the I think the, the joy is to be able to have the freedom uh, to do that well. So things might be smaller, congregations might be smaller, the, the work on the ground might be smaller. So there's a real sense of let's dig in deeper to God to see what he has in store, if that makes sense. No, that's good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I would say that parallels things here. Uh, one study, uh, uh, spoke about 40 percent of people in the church not returning after the pandemic uh, yeah. that resulted yeah. in about 20 percent of churches closing their doors and yeah. uh, the 40 percent are, are people that are you know active in the church they're tithers they're 
uh, active yeah. volunteering. And so the churches, as a result of taking a big hit, a lot of larger churches have downsized in terms of their staff and you know, different yeah. things like that. Uh, there's also been, uh, I describe it as this constant pressure. And so if there are businesses or churches or marriages or whatever that have cracks in them, or even people that have some, you know, issues in terms of personal issues, that yeah. kind of pressure has has caused uh, churches and businesses to crumble. Yeah, and so it's been it's been really a, a very challenging time. Um, I uh, found uh, a resource that's really helpful uh, for me. I, I may have sent it to you, Paul, but uh, it's yeah. by um, uh, Terry Teckel, and yeah. he's been writing a prayer for for decades now, but. He contrasts Mary and Martha, and he says there's Mary churches and Martha churches, and yeah. uh, that, that the Martha churches are the ones that are very, very active in programming and things, whereas the the uh, Mary churches sit at Jesus' feet, you know, and churches that seek his presence. And that's what I found. Like one pastor friend said, John, I've been busier than I've ever been before, you know, and what they're trying to do is maintain the infrastructure, yeah. of the church, yeah. which is crumbling, yeah. you know. Yeah. And yeah. uh, and I thought, you know, we have an opportunity, I think, to reconfigure. Uh, these yeah. people are saying, I want to go back to the way it was. And I thought, I don't. <laughs> a lot of people don't. I mean, this is where the 40% are dropping yeah. off because they, they, they've they gone to church. They've been dutiful, you know. But yeah. as they've had this hiatus, they've sort of said, this isn't really where, where I'm not being scratched where I itch, you know. Uh, especially with programs and everything tightly scripted, there's very little interaction with God. You know, yeah. uh, one of my mentors said, "You know, if God ever left in the middle of Sunday worship, would anybody notice?" <laughs> and, you know, I thought I've been right across the board in the body of Christ, and it's like, no, you know, even in Pentecostal or charismatic circles. I mean, we're we have worship and and uh, announcements and offering and then message. And yeah. very little engagement, you know, welcoming God to come and minister to the people. I think it's interesting because um, I'm sitting alongside uh, one of our, in fact, it's, it's, it's uh, one of, it was one of our biggest Methodist churches here in the city. And they did an amazing, amazing job all through uh, the pandemic of keeping an online church going, did a phenomenal job, you know, put lots of resource into it, lots of finance into it. And, uh, you know, fantastic job in fact they partnered with some other churches so they weren't doing it alone there was a fresh sense of unity and working together so that was really positive but the, the issue now is now that now that's all been put down what do we do now you know because actually you know we haven't got that we haven't got the you know 40 50 100 people who are watching online anymore we might have the 30 or 40 are coming through the door and it's a very different experience now to, to what it was so so i think they're not isolated there are churches like that are saying okay we were learning, just learning how to do church in this new way, but now that's not really there anymore. So how do we do church, you know, post COVID in a sense? So there's one or two churches where I, I'm just privileged to have some relationship with, where we're just trying to walk some of that out together really, because, you know, I've been used to over the years that I've worked with just finding that place of trying not to rush ahead, trying not to overthink things, but spend time with the Lord and, uh, Partly because we've not got a big ministry or a big organisation, but we've been able to to do that. And and part of the, you guys will know, but people who might watch this won't know. For since two thousand and seven, I've been part of House of Prayer in the city. And uh, the two simple things that we've been doing is to is to is to host host the presence of Jesus and, and prepare for his return. Two two simple things, really. You know about you know creating a space and a place where Jesus is welcome. And, uh, and getting ready for to be the best we can be as his church when he when he comes back you find a church spotless so it's been a pretty simple thing really so that sort of models um help me to engage some of the churches who've not had that as a focus so even now some sunday nights coming i'm just going to sit along some sides of these churches and just be try and have an environment where we just spend time listening and waiting and saying okay lord what's the direction and to be fair that's the place where we are as our house of prayer right now we're back in a, a phase of we've been sort of open and shut since september we've been trying to get some sort of rhythm back in the house but actually is that the right thing let's just pause for a, 
a few weeks and is, is there something else you want us to do interesting and when you pause actually it gives time for the lord just to speak doesn't it yeah 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 totally <laughs> one of the things that's uh, been attractive to me and we sort of fell into this when we came to vancouver and this is before we went to seattle um yeah. we were exposed to the toronto blessing spent a week there and uh, i was hungry after god because i thought if we made a mistake about moving out west we're going to be in deep trouble you know nah. <laughs> well, i knew that it was god but we didn't know anybody here and and it was a real step into the totally new yeah. and so I, I was really pressing into the lord uh so when we arrived out on the west coast as you know uh, with churches in the uk and elsewhere that were exposed to the toronto blessing it sort of uh, spread you know, to their communities yeah. where people had been there. Well, the Lord said, don't say anything about this. And the basis of that was that there had been renewal before that had been divisive. And uh, yeah. so uh, uh, what happened was we arrived in August, I guess, of 1994. That was when Alpha was released internationally. So we had the joy yeah. of introducing Alpha on the West Coast in Canada. And mm -hmm. then uh, we had a, a meeting of our leadership uh, in a, one of the leaders' homes, and uh, the senior pastor, the rector of the parish, uh, laid out a plan for house church, sort of small groups out of the church mm -hmm. as we grew to sustain. And you know, there's a lot of benefits from that kind of configuration in the local church. And yeah. he did a great job presenting it. And he said, "John, do you want to add anything?" And I said, "No, but I think you should pray into this." Well, I made the mistake of inviting the Holy Spirit to come. <laughs> he, he crashed into the meeting. We were all on the floor for like an hour and a half. Like, and, and afterwards, we said, what was that? Well, we knew what it was. But we said, how do we deal with this? So it opened the yeah. door initially to have bi-weekly, twice a week uh, yeah. meetings, Thursday and Sunday night. Then we, after a year or so, we went to the one on Sunday night. But... Um, we would, uh, the, dare I say, formula that, that the Lord mm -hmm. gave us was we had 20 minutes of worship welcoming the Lord. And yeah. the only thing that was the same was we, we uh, I get up and said, Lord, we've, through our worship, we've sought to enthrone you and welcome yeah. you. Uh, we yeah. understand that you're attracted by our worship and our unity. Mm -hmm. And as much as we're able to, we're, we're presenting ourselves to you. This is your meeting. Take us wherever you want. And uh, it was a great context for people learning how to hear and see what yeah. the Lord at work, moving in the gifts and various things. We were yeah. there uh, regularly in, until 11 or 12 midnight, sometimes mm -hmm. till two or three in the morning and once or twice beyond that even. Uh, yeah. And I found that the presence of God increased as the evening went on. So I found myself commonly on my face saying, God, we're not special in any way. We don't really pray a lot, but yet you've come to us. And uh, the pattern in the evening was uh, listening to the Lord. Yeah. And yeah. we would work on this um, so that at times you would wait as long as 20 minutes. And yeah. that wasn't just being quiet, it was being very attentive, but it was yeah. holding on to the revelation that God was giving us. I tried this at St. Luke's, it didn't work because... Yeah. People were trained whenever they got something to speak it out right away. Yeah. And that really disturbed that sense of waiting and quietness. So yeah. after the period of whether it's three minutes or five or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, mm -hmm. I would ask for feedback, secondly. And uh, they would say, you know, this is what God's showing us. And if there were any actionable kind of things out of that, I'd say, well, I sense the Lord may be calling us to respond in this way. So we would respond by, you know, uh, if he was directing us to pray for our, our mayor, for example. Well, we do yeah. that, you know. Yeah. And, and so various things. We had angelic visitations. We had this. So that pattern sort of continued, waiting on the Lord, um, yeah. reporting back and responding in action, you know, to that. Good. And as we obeyed the Holy Spirit, he would... Uh, his presence, the weight of his presence would increase. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I had a lot of fear about was if we, uh, I used it, quench the spirit or grieve the spirit. Um, you know, he, the, I had a sense that he'd pick up his bat and ball and go home. 
kind of thing. <laughs> and and I realized there were points where we sensed the presence would lift a bit. And then yeah. I, I and the rest of us would say, okay, Lord, somehow we're not engaging with you like you yeah. would like. Uh, and he wasn't wanting to leave. He was wanting to engage us. How do we assume a posture so that your presence would be would increase? And he would yeah. show us. We'd sometimes sing in the spirit or you know, yeah. different things that he would show us. And then the presence would come more and increase. Now, I discovered that this was similar to <laughs> the revival in the 17th century with the Quakers, where they yeah. spent time in quiet, and also the Welsh revival in 1904 and 1905. So um, that's something I began to explore. Now, in recent months, I have connected with a Roman Catholic parish that's near the Seattle airport. And the pastor of that church is the spiritual director for the Western Washington Catholic Charismatic Renewal. Okay, yeah. the west of the mountains, that dark diocese. And he loves the Lord, but he loves the presence of God. So mm -hmm. we do a hybrid meeting on Friday nights. We've taken a break through the summer. But <clears throat> he has the on-site, in-person component in his church. And uh, then there's an online component that Holly and I sort of oversee. So we, we spend an hour uh, with, you know, pressing in for God's presence, listening and recording. Yeah. And then we have kind of breakout rooms because there are people that come on that have personal needs, but we don't want that to overshadow <clears throat> our opportunity to hear God. So that's sort of the model that we've fallen into Yeah. Uh, in that. But what it is is sort of laying down our agenda. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and, you know, saying, God, we're available to you. And yeah. uh, 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 he will come in different ways, different times. And uh, so it's been every time it's different, you know. Yeah, I think this is the it's the it's the joy of some, um, I guess, non-denominational organizations is how do you say this best? I think where you, where you don't have to fit into a framework, that's 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 it's helpful, isn't it? I think sometimes there's an expectation because of the denomination you're in or the structure that you're in that you you apply that to your to where you are. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think that's part of the struggle that some of the some of the churches are having right now in the UK. That you know there's an expectation to almost deliver something, so you can't really just you can't just wait on God because actually you need to do something. You know you need to you need to you need to serve the congregation, or you need to or you need to to do something that actually looks like it's achieved something. I'm not sure if I explained that correctly, but so you don't quite have the freedom that some some would have. So, so for so for me and my friends at House of Prayer, well, we we're we're a interdenominational charitable trust, so we so we're accountable to the to the EA. So we have a an overseeing um, organisation. But actually, in terms of how how we gather together, it's much more fluid, and. Um, so that's that's good in, in a one sense, but it can also, you know, sometimes can be so fluid you're not quite sure what to do next. But I think it's important in the fact that if you don't have the times of of waiting, you know, you can you can go ahead along into, you know, organising the next, you know, uh, few months and find out actually you were you, you were off track. And I was just reflecting last night because, like I said, we were we're in this phase again right now where we're just we're just pressed pause a little bit and. We had in the city uh, between 2001 and 2007 something called the, the 2C7 uh, prayer movement, and um, it started with a just a shall we meet shall we meet on a on a October the 31st and have a united prayer meeting, and it was all based around what was going on in the in the city. There'd been a there been a poll uh, about the best and worst places to to live in the UK, and Stoke-on-Trent became was the last on the list basically. So we were at the bottom of the list. Wow. And uh, a good friend of mine, Lloyd, Lloyd, just said, "Well, we ought to pray about this, really. Shall we get together?" And we so we booked a sort of a neutral territory, and there's me and him and Lloyd, and we we put some we put about twenty chairs out, thinking you know people might prayer meetings not very attractive, really. So maybe people will turn up when no, they don't. And two hundred people turned up on that on the wow. first night to pray. Wow, was and, that uh, so, was that Lloyd Cook? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we know. Lloyd. Yeah, so 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 we still work together a lot, Lloyd and I still work together uh, every month. We're still still good friends and and partners together. Uh, so so yeah. that began a movement that that was unexpected because it was almost like this. 
in fact that Lloyd said at the time, you know, we could blame society, we can, can blame government, we can blame the council about the way the city is, but actually the fact is, it's not the quality and quantity of the darkness, it's the quality and quantity of the light that's the important thing. That's going to be the thing that's going to transform the city. So he, he came over to me that night, it was October 31st, 2001, and I, I was leading worship at the Keys, and uh, we hit a moment where we were like, this is quite significant, you know, God's doing something in the room right now, because we've given him some space, really. This is what we're talking about, giving him space to, to speak. So he came across and said, what do you think about meeting same time next month? Mm-hmm. So, so he, he and I and Robert said, let's go for it. And then that happened for the next seven years. So, you know, wow. every, every Wednesday night on a, we, we met together. And what did we do? We, we came together to, to worship, to pray, to seek his face, to humble ourselves around 2 Chronicles 7.14. You know, if my people right. humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And this is what we're, I think this is what we're talking about, really. You know, are we going to spend time just laying down some of the agendas that we have, what we think church should look like and what, what, we, should, what we should sound like as this church and say, okay, Lord, we want to lay that down, humble ourselves before you and say, what, what do you want? So over that seven years, we, you know, we, we brought in, like you said, we brought in local mayors, the chief, the chief of the fire department, police departments. You know, what can we pray for? What does the city need? How can we pray? What are the top two things that you would ask us to pray for? You know, and, that, and over that seven years, we went from two to four to 600 people came, you know, on, on Wednesday evenings. And it wasn't revival, but it was definitely a move of God's people saying, you know, we recognize that, you know, we, we, we have a responsibility for the place that we live to, to worship you, Lord, to make, to declare you Lord over the city that we live in, but also to say, actually, how, how can we, your people be, be the light that this place needs. And it started, a, it was a complete mind shift really, because we, we suddenly started to appreciate the value of our worship and our prayer together. Those, those two things that were really vital that would see, you know, things start to move and shift. We even joked, we had, we had uh, our, chief editor of the local newspaper and, and uh, we said you know what do you see in the city you you write the news headlines all the time what are the things that re- are really needed in stoke and uh, and he, he said you know one thing that would be great would for the morale of the city would see see the the football team going to the premier division <laughs> yeah, you know so so can you pray for football so he said well yeah. if, that, if that's going to lift the you know the spirits of the people that, let's go for it the next month the, the local team went to the premiership and uh, was that a coincidence? Maybe it was, but actually it was such a lift, actually, not just for the people of the city, but actually for the praying people to go, actually, you know, maybe this praying stuff works. And <laughs> I, yeah, I remember really well in, in the early days of that. I'm saying this now because it sets a context of where we are now. You know, we don't want to live in the past, but there are some things that we learn absolutely from the past that shape where sure. we are right now. And uh, I remember in the early days, people saying, why are we singing so much? I thought this was a prayer meeting you know and because we we got so used to compartmentalizing you know like we we're saying we have our structured church we have you know three fast ones one slow one you yeah. know in the worship time and that's the presence of god comes and that and that's it and we have a preach and um uh, and we were learning this 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 whole thing about our worship intercession what it is to lift our hearts before the lord and to <clears throat> welcome his presence and say here you are lord you are lord of the city the lord of the church yeah. what what do you want to do with us what, what's on your agenda okay. and so we, we carried that all the way through those those seven years and uh towards the end of those seven years we we felt to move that into a place of, of mission because there's only so long you can stay behind closed doors as the church isn't there? and things were happening you know don't get me wrong nothing wasn't nothing happening in the city so we we felt to have a a mission healing mission time and we had we booked a huge marquee uh, in the south of the city and we had 12 12 nights and we invited people to come and bring families bring children and uh, we invited a, a guy to come who'd got a healing uh, testimony and I think over 12 nights we had about 10,000 people came through the tent and it was just a glory a glory time and um, but it was all based around the sense of we are going to open up a space and a place for you Jesus to come and touch and transform not just um, you know individuals but transform a city and transform the atmosphere where we live and uh, significant thing for me that was a real challenge you were talking john there about sort of 
what I would call ways of the spirit, you know, where you where you, you come to a place and you're not quite sure, should we move on or should we should we wait or should we move back into worship or should we pray? Uh, remember the conversation very clearly around the mission, you know, well, let's let's have some opening worship and let's invite Craig to come and preach and we'll invite people to receive uh, receive prayer and, you know, and maybe around 10 o'clock, if, if it's still busy, we'll put some music on and, you know, just see what happens. I really remember well the first, the first night we had a time just of welcoming the Lord and some opening worship time and Craig got up and preached and at 10 o'clock, People were still being prayed for. There was a, there was a, a mass of people at the front of the of the of the tent, and uh, I, I just did what I was told. Ten o'clock, press play on the CD player. You know, thanks band, great night. I felt the Lord say, "What have you done that for? What have you done that for?" Because there's something about you know the continuation of our opening our hearts and our, our worship. There's a there's like a an ebb and a flow that the Holy Spirit wants us to be involved in. So I went back to the team and said, look, I'm happy to play to the last person standing because I think there's something about us partnering and worshiping prayer together that invites something deeper that the Holy Spirit wants to do. So that's what we did for the last 11 nights. I think we, we, we started worship at six and most nights we finished about midnight, you know, when the last person was standing in the tent. But it was all about this sense of we started to realize there was a river of God that was running through the tent. And the more we engaged with him, the more we offered ourselves in worship, like you were saying, John, earlier, the stronger his presence came and he was doing, doing more in those times. So we've carried that right through into, you know, I learned a lot during those times about uh, persistence and worship, about hanging around the Lord and just saying, OK, it might not be, you know, the, the best, the, might not be the, best, the best worship song, but actually here I am. Will you will you just take what we have and um, allow your spirit to flow through it, really? And uh, that that's where we still are. So. I'm not sure I've been a bit of a ramble that really, but I think it's some, we learned something about the, the key thing was the importance of this this partnership with our, our prayer and our worship that was we call it now the two wings of the eagle, you know one one wing is the prayer mm. and one wing is the worship. And actually, when they when they come together, it's like a perfect yeah. uh, place of His presence. This cool. has been attributed to a number of leaders throughout church history, but yeah. I believe it was first Saint Augustine of Hippo, an early. Yeah. Church leader who said when we sing we pray twice yeah <laughs> so, so worship it's not an either or you know worship really is a, a way of engaging the lord uh, yeah to, to welcome him you know uh, i think, think i think in, re think in recent times i mean um so i just put in i think i i, I love i love the diversity of, of the of, of the work the worship world of worship and the different leaders and the streams I, I just got challenged a couple of years ago about direction in terms of, of that because for me, when when I when I lead worship, what I, what I want to do is, is, a, is open a open a door. I think it's, that's that's what I often say if I with my team. I just say let's let's open the door today to sit and, and two two way. It's like a two way door. One for us to walk in, one for all the glory to come out <laughs> in a sense. And uh, so and a lot of the, the, the songs that I was. I was hearing and even playing were about were we're, we're feeding songs really you know lord I, I need you lord you know i'm in a desperate place will you come and save me and, and those are all valid songs but i wasn't hearing much about you know who jesus was and mm. you know you know his name the power in his name and all the names that he holds then he reminded me that every every name that he has he's he's the fullness of that name so when when he's the healer he's absolutely the fullness of healing when he delivers he fully delivers when he saves he fully saves and uh, so I, I just set to write some songs about that. I thought, actually, Lord, I think we need to come back to a place of declaring who you are. And because uh, I think in, in the early days of, because it's like you guys know, it's just 25 years now since we dedicated our, ourselves just to to become ushers in, in that place. You made me some promises, you know, if you'll worship me and welcome my presence, I'll save, heal and deliver. In a sense, you know, people can preach and, and teach and share, but actually the one thing that's going to make a difference is an encounter with me. So if you'll open the door to that. So I just, and I still still, still sing songs about, Lord, will you come and, will you come and save? Will you come and rescue? But actually, the deep place I think we find ourselves is when we exalt him and we say, we welcome you, Lord Jesus. This is who you are. And make that declaration in our, our worship. 
That's the door that opens his, to his power, I think, and his presence. Yeah. <laughs> I'm cheering up, Paul. You're cheering up. You're cheering up. <laughs> well, I mean, that's really what we're called to, to welcome him and to exalt him and to, to, to engage his presence, you know. And that's yeah. been the burden of my heart is to provide a setting for that to happen. I remember when we left our, our second parish, we had a lot of friends from other churches that came to the closing service, and it was lovely for them uh, for, for them to come. But as it happened in our cycle within our parish, we were doing the traditional liturgy. And yeah. uh, one friend came to me just in tears after, and they said, they're Anglican background, and they said, I've never been in a spirit-directed, spirit-filled liturgy like that. And, and it was the traditional wording. And uh, I call it crack. I'm <laughs> really broken now. Oh, I and I, 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 my burden has been to crack open the liturgy to make the Lord welcome, you know. Yeah. And that's yeah. often done through silence or through interruptions. I mean, that was the big deal in seminary. <laughs> the biggest threat was silence and interruptions. You know, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I actually look forward to that because <laughs> you, know, you know we don't give God a lot of opportunity to break in. You know, no. and it happened randomly. I remember hearing about a Black Baptist church um, that during the pastoral prayer, you know, that people submit the needs of the community, and the pastor gets up and just sort of prays for ten or fifteen minutes into those areas, sort of himself, you know, but directing yeah. people to join in unity, and the Lord. Uh, impressed upon him to just stop and and tell people to break into small groups and pray as the Holy Spirit directed them and the Spirit of God just fell on the place you know yeah. as he yeah. just listened to the Holy Spirit and did something a little bit different I yeah. remember uh, one Baptist pastor friend he tried to change the order of service and he had a rebellion you know <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I thought, so at St. Luke's, I used to switch things up, you know. Uh, yeah. Traditionally, there's the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the table in our Eucharist, our communion service. Well, I'd start with communion and then finish with the word and sermon and an altar call, you know, just ah. switch it up. And and I said this, I do this deliberately, usually around the seasons of uh, Lent and Advent that we'd introduce new things and people knew it was only for a short period of time and yeah. they they put up with it but it made people more malleable and then maybe yeah. two, three times a year we'd have what i call a holy spirit meltdown where the holy spirit would just come in power but we were ready yeah. for it and i said to the sunday school that met at the same time i said look you know we'll let you know because often we're there for a couple hours more than their regular time you know and i said yeah. Uh, you know, you may miss your your uh, communion today if you have to leave, but we'll be a place you need to move back and forth however you're led. But I'd invite yeah. the Sunday school kids to come up because I said, I want you to experience the presence of God. And right, it was yeah. very quiet, very gentle, very just really sensing the love of God. But people would fall out and just all kinds of things would happen as yeah. its manifest presence would come, you know. I uh, love, love that. And we, I think, when when we when we finished our when we finished our season of, of praying, we had, we had these seven years that I was talking about. We, I was I was very resistant to let that go because with the, as a team, uh, Lloyd and some others, they felt we ought to would preach on the ground, and I was like, oh, why, why, why would we want to do that? You know, you know, God's been on the move. There's been some powerful things that have taken place, and and I think you you become. Even in the the times of glory, you can you can become settled in that place and just miss miss the what God's doing in it all. Really, you know, He doesn't want us to stay in that in that place. So I I remember I I'm not I'm not a very uh, what's the word I'm not great at arguments, but I remember saying at the time I don't think this is really why would you do that? I, I'm not really in agreement. And uh, but actually looking back on it now, it was it was absolutely the right thing. If if we'd not done that, we so many things. So many things began as as we put that thing down. The house of prayer was burst. Lots of what we call Samaritan ministry started. You know, ministries to the street started because people have been envisioned and empowered. Actually, there's something that happened during those seven years of praying and worship together, 
actually gave them a, a fresh sense of purpose with, with God to actually take what they had and, and carry it into the streets and make and make a difference in, in if, if we like, the real world, in a tangible uh, world. And uh, it was important for us because this whole thing about waiting and, and listening I think just a couple of months after we, we closed down the public meetings, we've carried on the, we have leaders meetings that have carried on since then every, every month. But we, Tracy and I and a bunch of friends who were part of that whole journey, we, we just knew he was disturbing us really. You know, there was, there was a, a season of change and we weren't quite sure what it, what it was, but, but I knew enough from my personal journey that actually you can't keep holding on to the old thing and then fully grasp the new thing you've got to let this whole thing go and i was very grateful to god that he gave me that lesson early on really yeah so so we we, we decided to set up a space where we said oh, if anyone else wants to let go of some stuff why don't you come meet with us <laughs> so we so, so, we, so we booked a room at the local radio station every tuesday night and said we're just going to come we're going to worship and we're going to try and listen to god and say here we are what on earth do we do next we had no clue you know tracy and i and some friends we, we were still in local church and we, you know, that, that was okay. But we knew God was moving us outside. He gave us a, a taste of something that was, that was new, but we weren't quite sure how we were going to engage with that. So, so we, we, we met for a number of months just on a Tuesday night. And, and uh, a lot of what we did was, was nothing. We had, we did like worship for 20 minutes and we just sat on the ground for an hour, mm. just sitting with the Lord going, we haven't got a clue. But what we know is we want you. We just want you and uh, and often we wouldn't hear anything particularly but we we learned actually this this uncomfortable skill of just sitting and waiting and just being and uh and i think that is part of the struggle where where the church is at right now because there's a sense of now pandemic is over we need to go 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 we need to do something now because the doors are now open and People need us and, you know, God needs us to do something. And I'm not sure he does. So, yeah, I think there's still a bit of this, will you just come and be with me? Mm -hmm. Will you come in? We've had the word a couple of times this week in our prayer room about abiding. Will, will you just abide? Will you just come and be? So we, we had, we've had some really awesome silence these past few weeks. I don't know if you felt it, but when we, when we were on the call to you guys in, a couple of weeks ago, you know, when, when we finished worship, it was just like I felt it in my I felt it in my conservatory, and I could sense it in other rooms. We were just we just paused, and even though we were across the internet, the Lord was just with us in those rooms, and He was just asking us just to stop for a second. Yeah. And and I just wonder if that's a place that's a place where I, I feel right now because I I'm, I was sharing privately with you guys. You know, I, I after the last pandemic, I wasn't really sure. I was I was a bit shaken. wasn't sure about my role in the future. You know, I knew he called me to be an usher of his presence. Well, what does that look like in the next season? How do I plan for that? What do I do about that? And uh, you know, a bit of anxiety crops in around that. But I think I'm starting to to realise again that actually it's not about what I can do anyway. At the end of the day, it's about you know who I can be in his presence. So. But it's quite an uncomfortable place and we 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 as a community so as a prayer community in our local community are trying to relearn some of that stuff out of pandemic what's it like to to abide with him and just allow him to sit with us in that place so i think you know we, we had a lovely time of worship last night together and i just i just i left the keyboard for a while i said you know i, I love this lord i love i love i love standing behind the keyboard and i love because you've given me this and i know you've given me it for a purpose but actually Sometimes I just stand to the side and go, it doesn't matter. If this if this disappeared, it yeah. doesn't matter really as long as I can have you. And I and I, I'm learning that. So I think I think I think that's that's a difficult place for, for the church. You know, we're sort of going back to the question we started with, what's it look like in the UK? I think there's still a bit of vying for I think we need to do something, so we're trying this, that and the other, and some of it's gonna work actually. I think there's still some waiting and listening to, still to do. Yeah. Mm. Paul, thank you for sharing your heart. This is this has been a very profound conversation. Uh, I'd like to suggest as we sort of close off, and we'll maybe revisit this. It's lovely to reconnect with you. Yeah. Uh, 
but would you just pray into that? Pray for yeah. Holly and me and pray for the church in North America or however you're directed to. But, you know, you've shared a lot about, you know, just pursuing him. And yeah. uh, would you just pray into that as we close? Absolutely. Yeah. It is a really good to uh, to spend some time with you, even across the, the yeah. airwaves. Yeah. You know, Father, I am, I'm grateful that, you know, much as we'd like to be face to face, we know that the reality is that you are you are with us. You know, even though we're time zones apart and we're, and we're nations apart, in this moment, you, you're right here and now with us. And that just blows our mind, Julie, really, because, you know, you're the God who's outside time, who's outside space. And and the, the reality is that you you want to you want to be with us and you know you created us to be in relationship with you and to walk with you and i i'm just going back to that place now and i i i know that john and holly that their heart is to is to open who they are to you and to to serve to serve you and to to give who they are to you and we're, we're in on that same page lord and we we're asking that in the season ahead you you teach us what it is to have this place of abiding in your in your presence of coming into that place and space that jesus you made so so open for us but the place sometimes we we get so busy around that we don't actually walk into or spend time in so so we say lord where, where we've done that we, we're sorry for that lord if there's things on our agenda things on our minds that we think we should be doing or you know places we think we should be going Maybe you're just recentering us on that place around you, your throne again, that place where, you know, in those moments, nothing else really, really matters <laughs> because you've got it all. You've, you've got it in your hand. You've got the, the answers that we need. You've got the provision we need. You've got our futures worked out. And uh, so I pray that for, for me and for Tracy and our family, and I pray it for Holly and John and their families we've shared about you know where where we're at all the, the ups and downs of families and we we thank you that in this place of your presence you have everything that we need and we we ask that you'd remind us about that and give us your fresh assurance because you know in, in our humanity you know we we have our, our wobbles our our struggles and we you know we say did you really say that lord did, is that what you really want us to do and i pray that as we as we decide and choose to maybe let go of some of the, the pressures and the responsibilities that we think we have and enter into that place with you. You would give us a fresh clarity about uh, the season ahead. That for John and Holly and ministry that you call them to, that you would just open up the doors and opportunities that you, you want them to engage in. And if there's things that they need to lay down or, or to put down, there'd be uh, an ease in doing that and an assurance that that's okay. And I ask that for, for me and for Tracy too, as we, you know, enter this time of Thanksgiving for all you've done over these these years. We know that you're not done yet, Lord. So, and we don't want to assume that the the future is going to look like the past. So, in all these things, we want to submit our our lives and uh, who we are to you. And I'm so grateful, Lord, that for the reminder you you've given to me just right in these past weeks that in the early days of presence worship, you said, you know, when you get a ministry, Paul Critchley it's all over because <laughs> you, your role is to minister to me that that's the deal so whatever you call us into lord help us remember that our our first call is to, to minister to your heart and to, to bless you lord and out of all those things you'll, you'll show us the way lord so i, I pray your blessing into to the household of uh, particularly that space and place where john and holly are right now and while you'd you'd um remind them that you know might whilst it might not be the perfect place that you are in in that in that space and place with them and uh, two for my household and our, and our children as they everything has been changing these past months father i offer them back to you again and the things that we know are not perfect father we 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 leave with you and say we trust you lord for our futures and we give you thanks for, for what's gone behind us and what's ahead of us and say so will you get great glory as we we choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your time. You can stop the recording, too. <laughs> so uh, she's going to stop the recording. <laughs>